All right. Uh, thank you, whoever joined uh, with us today. Uh, I will be presenting Dr. Nita Shandwani. She is a, an associate. Uh, she's an associate pediatric pediatric dentist at Boston Children's, uh, or she used to be in Boston Children uh, Hospital. And she is an assistant professor uh, of developmental biology at the Harvard School of Dental Medicine. She has received her dental degree from Bombay University in India and completed her pediatric dentistry residency at Boston University. She has been actively involved in both clinical practice and teaching both nationally and internationally throughout her career. Her primary focus has always been working with children with special health care needs. Uh, thank you, doctor, for giving us uh, today the dental management of a child with a special health care needs. I do know how passionate you are uh, working uh, with, this, with this population, which collide with our interest as well. Um, and uh, I will leave the presentation up to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. And uh, since it's such a small group, maybe I'll just start with finding out who Ms. Habiba and Mahu are so that I can tailor my talk accordingly. So do you mind just introducing yourselves, please? Habiba or Mahu? Oh, maybe there's something in the chat. Who goes first? Mahu, since you typed. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Mahu, and I'm currently a fifth year dentistry student. And um, what else do I say? <laughs> That's good. Yeah, I'm currently studying dentistry at Ajman University. And um, we have a research uh, project with Dr. Kashif. And I'm sure that you guys know about it by now. And yeah, that's pretty much about it. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. No worries. Hello, everyone. My name is Zailan. I am a mother, a housewife for two kids, one of them on the spectrum. And I would like to uh, know more about uh, what you can provide. And uh, thank you so much for the uh, link of the meeting. Uh, lovely meeting you all. Thank you. Is there anyone else or can I get started? Okay. Yeah, you can go ahead. Okay. So, Jalen, um, I did not make this talk specific to the children on the spectrum, but I have included a fair amount of my talk on um, the, on children, on the dental management of children on the spectrum, because that has been, like Rahij mentioned, my always been interested in working with special health care needs, particularly those on the spectrum. So, I'll um, give you all a very brief talk, and then I'd leave some time open for questions. Right. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Sure. Okay. So as he mentioned earlier, I moved from very, very cold Boston to very, very nice and warm Dubai, and the weather here is perfect. But the traffic is worse in Dubai than it is in Boston. That's all I can say. I don't miss the snow, but um, I love it. And Dubai is home for me. So what we're going to talk about today is basically just a brief introduction on what exactly do we mean when we say, we in the healthcare field say, when we um, use the term special healthcare needs. And like I mentioned a few minutes ago, I will be touching upon um, working with kids on the spectrum. How do we manage this oral care? What is our framework that we follow? How do we actually manage the patient in the chair or in the clinic whenever they do come to us? And then I'll save the last part for just making parents or caregivers aware of um, some form of oral health that we would like um, you to do at home for your child, which will lead to prevention versus rather than you know us having to drill and fill cavities. So when we say special health care needs, any child or any individual that um, shows any kind of um, Deficiency is a better word in terms of behavioral, cognitive abilities, development, emotional, physical, anything that would require extra care that is different from what a normal 
for a, from a non neurotypical child, whether it be in terms of uh, medical care, dental care, school, whatever it is, that's what a child with special health care needs would require. And as we all know, children on the spectrum have a particular um, conditions, conditions probably the wrong word, but according to the DSM-4, the, the facilities that we need to address are difficult and difficulty in social communication, and they may also exhibit restricted or repetitive behavior. And the reason we need to know as dentists or as care providers, we need to know the background and everything about the disorder that we're treating, because otherwise we won't be able to appropriately work with these children and of course the parents. So as dentists, the first and foremost thing for us is we need to know all about our patients, who they are, what are their comorbidities, what is their medical history, whether they go to a physician, then oftentimes we stay in touch with the physician just to find out what else is going on with them. We need to know what the functional abilities are. Can the child, is the child mobile? Can they communicate? Can they take care of their of themselves? Is the parent involved? Is there another caregiver? So we need to know all these functional abilities, which will help us even design a prevention plan for that particular child. Just like when a child goes to school, they have an IEP. It's almost like, I wouldn't call this an IEP, but we we base our, our treatment and our prevention to that particular child. And of course, being dentists, we do need to know what the oral status of the child is, you know, whether they have um, whether they have any soft tissue problems, whether they have any gum issues, whether they have cavities, whether they have any dental trauma. Of course, that's part of what we would need to know. I did mention we need to learn about a patient, but what is more important to us is the family. The patient doesn't come alone. The patient comes with the family. And, you know, families oftentimes have other concerns that they may have besides teeth. For example, if a child has, you know, any other comorbidities, the dental care may be the last on their list. The child, you know, it's easy for me to say brush your teeth two times a day, but there could be a family where it's hard for them to even get out of the door. So, you know, brushing your teeth two times a day may not be something that is that easy or that possible. Or the parent may have other children that they may have to, you know, take care of also. So we're very mindful of the entire unit as a functional unit being the family. So we make sure we address family's concerns. The family may tell us that every time we go to the dentist, we have the child reacts in a certain way, or he's afraid to go to the dentist, or every time he goes to the he or she goes to the physician, we have such and such experience. So we need to know all of these things, and we do know all of these things, which makes our care a little more holistic. And of course, the word consent goes without saying anything we do, we have to have consent for anything and everything that we do. And that's usually obtained from the parent or the caregiver, whoever is accompanying the child. If you see the picture, I mean, oftentimes when you're laying in a chair, that is really not how scary we look, but sometimes that is the caricature that a dentist will look like. So imagine a child who's already, and I'll um, focus a little bit on the ASD, a child who's brought into an unnatural or an unfamiliar environment, lots of sounds, lots of noises, so there's bound to be some form of behavior um, issues that can occur because of the environment that we put them in. It could be poor cooperation. They could have, it may be hard for them to communicate. Some of them may be nonverbal. So communication can be an issue as well as to how will we know what the child is feeling. And based on their behavior, they may be not able to sit in the chair or even allow us to examine uh, for more than a few minutes. And oftentimes they may be exhibiting stimming because of the um, stressful environment that we put them in. You know, and oftentimes there may be self-injurious behavior as well, which can happen in the clinic because, like I said, the environment is not conducive to them, their their familiarity, and they can have temper tantrums. So I, I just put all of these, and a child could exhibit one, more than one, or none. But these are the this is the range of the behavior that we may end up seeing as dentists in our practice whenever we see a child with special health care needs. Because like I mentioned earlier, special health care needs is such a wide, spe wide 
array of symptoms and an array of conditions. So we can expect, we should expect any of these behaviors that, that can accompany it. Uh, again, sticking to ASD, um, child on ASD is oftentimes hypersensitive to stimuli, which could include all the ones that I've mentioned, touch, motion, sound, smells, taste, visual stimuli. So what do we as dentists do to mitigate some of these uh, stimuli and their oversensitivity to them? So what we would do is in case, and how do we know all of this? Of course, the most important thing is the parent tells us everything. The parent was our best friend in this situation where the parent is going to give us all the information about their child. So if, if the parent says they don't like touch, then we make sure we don't, you know, obviously don't touch them on their arm or their shoulder other than whatever we need to, which is the mouth. If they say then they don't like texture, you know, some of the toothpaste that we use for cleaning, it's a little gritty. So then we would alter the texture, use their own toothpaste, use something different. If they don't like the taste, we will allow them to frequently rinse. So as you can see, we're often, we're making all sorts of accommodations based on that child. Many a times children carry their own weighted blankets. So if they have that and it gives them comfort, we tell the parents to bring that uh, with them. And sudden movements can be quite unnerving. So many a times we will have the chair already slightly reclined so that when the child sits and we don't suddenly move them and you know that can be quite unnerving for the child. And as you know, when you go to the dentist, of course, there's a light that shines pretty much close to your uh, face and we make sure that we don't have the light shining in the child's eyes. And if the child is, if the room is too bright, we can dim overhead lights, we can put sunglasses. Again, all sorts of accommodative measures to make the child feel comfortable and you know, have a better experience at the dentist. Many a times children are used to uh, listening to music, so they bring their own headphones or they put a white noise machine. A quiet room, if it's a busy practice, you want to make sure that the room is very quiet. You don't want people coming in and out of the room. And uh, just keep it simple and keep it calm and comfortable for the child. Sometimes the gloves, perfumes, we make sure that everything is, um, we try and reduce all the sensory um, stimuli as best as we can in the dental office. And I'm sure those of you who've been to a dentist, which pretty much everybody has, there's a lot of noises. The drill makes a lot of noise, so we can't remove the noise, but we can certainly remove the, the surrounding noises to make the experience a little more comfortable. And like I mentioned earlier, our, the parent is our best friend. So we definitely want to speak to the parent before we have an interview with the parent, <clears throat> speaking to them, asking them, what works best for your child? And many a times we have them uh, familiarize the child with the environment beforehand. And uh, we sometimes can give them, you know, like a plastic mirror so that the child knows what to expect when they come to the dentist. And I'm sure if, um, I'm sure you're all familiar with the, with the books, social stories, video modeling that you can show, which a lot of kids on the spectrum have during their ABA therapies anyways. So we have social stories, which have, the one on the right is actually a, a social story written in Arabic that I found online. Essentially, it lists step-by-step step what the child will experience or what the child will see when they go to the dentist. And then we can show them videos of children having gone to the dentist and you know custom-made books so essentially desensitizing the child to the environment so that they're much more familiar with what they will contend with when they do come to visit us. Other approaches that we use to make the child comfortable. If the parent says, my child has, um, let's say another comorbidity that affects their behavior and they take their medication in the morning and they're best behaved in the morning. So obviously we will accommodate that by making the appointment in the morning. We always have the parents in the operatory with us because the parents, and I cannot really stress this again and again, is the best person to tell us about their child. The child is familiar with the parent. They're not going to just have two strangers try to try and do um, you know, a dental exam on your child. So the parent is always with us. The appointments are short because the attention span is going to be um, not that long. It depends, especially in the beginning, we keep the appointments really short. 
we don't want them waiting in the room for so in the waiting room for so long. So we have them come in as come and see us as soon as they arrive. And I mentioned the desensitization visits, which can be done not just by the uh, familiarization before they come, but also during the visits. We make the appointment short. We can start with something very small the first time they come in, depending on their on the behavior. The first time may be a short visit where they just or fam get familiar with the environment. They may sit in the chair, take the chair up and down, see something small, and that could be one step of the visit. You break it down, and that's okay. As long as the parents understand that, you know, you're not going to get everything done at one go. And that, as long as the parent understands that, then we can work with them and make this familiar, uh, and make the environment a lot more familiar with time. And um, a lot of children on the spectrum like sameness. So we make sure we keep the same personnel flexible. Like I said, if the parent says, I need to come in the morning, we'll make sure we come in the morning. And all the other personnel who are working with us are trained and um, are equally trained as, you know, to make sure that they make the child comfortable. We recommend that a child see the dentist every six months. And if a child has special health care needs, we usually recommend that a child see the dentist every three months. And this is more for prevention and to catch something earlier than we would if you just come when a child is in pain. So how do we actually work with children? If you see um, the type of techniques we use, which are pretty explanatory, but it says tell, show, do. So we tell the child a little bit about what we're going to do. Again, this is based on comprehension level, but we still tell the child what we're going to do we show them, for example, I'm going to clean your teeth. I will show them the toothbrush. I would show it to them, move on their finger, for example, and then I will do it. So it's not just suddenly putting something unfamiliar in the child's mouth or in the child's reference of things. Always reinforcing the child positively. But he's mentioned earlier a sticker. We would do something very similar. similar. Sticker telling them that, you know, if we do, if you open your mouth, you get this or whatever the the incentive maybe. And um, if a lot of pediatric dental offices have TVs uh, like on the ceiling. So many times you have a movie playing or anything that's a distraction, that's a distractor can be very, very useful. And of course, parents. So how do we position the child when we want to examine them if they don't sit in the dental chair? So if it's a little child, you can see that we have the parent and the provider and the dentist sitting knee to knee, and then the child is facing the parent. And this is how we can examine a young child. Even if a child is a little older, as long as we can hold them and if they're fighting or combative, this is a good way to at least get a look. And you can also do a cleaning and some fluoride treatment. You can do a lot of that in this position. If a child's in the wheelchair, they're oftentimes more comfortable in the wheelchair because they're also familiar with that position. And many times it may be difficult to move them. So we do the examination in the wheelchair. We would stand behind along with the assistant and we can get um, our exam, oftentimes even treat, small treatment done in the wheelchair itself. If you notice the picture at the bottom, it looks like a scissor-like thing and that's called a mouth prop, which many a times we have to use. Of course, we get parental consent it looks scary, but it isn't scary, actually, because it just helps keep the child's mouth open a little bit, because otherwise, if I have sharp instruments and the child bites down, they have the uh, there's a possibility that they may hurt themselves. So this helps keep the mouth open for short periods of time so I can examine on one side and then switch it and examine on the other side. And of course, having been used to this, we're very familiar with you know, anticipating any kind of movements that the child may have. So we're we work quickly. Um, a lot of kids on the spectrum are used to having task strips, which tells them step by step, this is what you need to do. So this is something, something like this is what we would recommend that the parent use for the child to tell them that this is what, these are the steps when you need to brush your teeth, toothbrush, put on toothpaste, you know, go with, follow step by step. Similarly, when they come to the dentist, we have a similar task strip or this is just an example, it doesn't have to be this one. So we tell them first you sit in the dental chair then we check it off, open mouth, check it off. So step-by-step step, they know that once step one is done, step two will follow and so on and so forth. Makes it a lot, makes the treatment a lot easier. 
Um, oftentimes, based on the behavior of the child and the nature of the appointment, sometimes it may be an emergency appointment where I have to do something, you know, let's say the child falls down and breaks his tooth and there's no way for me to, to um, address that, that issue without being able to do a proper exam. This is called protective stabilization. It's basically a, a board which has Velcro straps and it helps keeps the child secure. And many children who are on the spectrum often feel comfortable when they're, it's like the equivalent of a, of a blanket. And the parent is right there helping us. And this helps us take care of some of the more uh, pressing issues that may occur in terms of an emergency or even getting treatment done. If we cannot treat the child in the chair, let's say we've tried our best and it doesn't, um, you know, we can't get much done. There are alternative advanced treatment options, such as using laughing gas. Sometimes a child, if they have a lot of work that needs to be done, they may need to be seen in the hospital under general anesthesia. And depending on the behavior, there are studies which show that many patients do require dental care under general anesthesia. And if that is the case, then all the treatment that the child requires is done at one time. So that was a lot about what we do as dentists. I'm just going to shift gears and talk about what the parents or the caregivers need to be aware of in terms of oral health care. So we try and introduce uh, dentistry to a child, the, the, not dentistry, but the dental concept to a child as early as possible. The American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry recommends that a child, regardless of you know neurotypical or otherwise, needs to be seen by the dentist by at least age one. And most people wonder that, why am I seeing my child? Why am I bringing my child at age one? They barely have any teeth. It's pretty much to talk about prevention and you know discuss so many things, which, which you're gonna see some of um, in the next slides, but to prevent, uh, is to make the child familiar with coming to the dentist on a regular basis and discuss any other concerns that the child may have. So we also talk about prevention. We talk about fluoride rinsing, fluoride varnish. These are just things that we apply, which have fluoride on them, not on a regular basis, but once every six months or once every three months, with the varnish, which help in, um, which work as an anti-cavity um, treatment. And like I mentioned earlier, we talk about the um, autonomy of care that the child may have. Can they take care of themselves? Do they need help brushing? If they need help brushing, can do they need any adaptive, adaptive um, devices attached to their toothbrush, which helps them hold it. Does the parent need to help brush? So then we show the parent how to brush the child's teeth. And if you look at these white plastic looking things, these are just things that a parent can use at home. Remember you saw that, uh, that scissor looking thing, that's what we would use at the dental office, but something as simple as, a, as even tongue blade sticks wrapped with gauze can help keep the child's mouth open while the parent brushes on one side and then switches and goes to the other side. Because a common complaint is, I can't open his mouth and I can't brush his teeth. Most parents say that. So this is one way of doing it. And as we go on, I'll also show you some positions you can uh, hold the child where you can actually help brush the teeth. And most importantly, we talk to the parent about nutrition, not about providing nutritional, um, uh, I guess, uh, advice, but to sort of indicate what foods can cause caries, what foods are healthier and things like that. So very briefly, uh, for the non-dentists in the group, how does a cavity form? If you eat starches, sugars mixed with bacteria, you get acid, acid attacks your tooth, that leads to a cavity. Sounds simple, but essentially it's Something as simple as keeping your teeth clean, regularly brushing can actually prevent a lot of this from happening. I mentioned briefly about nutrition. So it's not just what we eat, but how often do we eat these things? So for example, frequency of eating as seen here, you know, the child is using a bottle, then breakfast, then snacks. So there's constantly starches and sugars sitting on those teeth and they don't have time to really clear their mouth which is why there's a higher chance of you developing a cavity if you eat more frequently. And it's not so, like I said, it's not so much what you eat, but it's also how frequently you eat it. Because the bacteria in our mouth can make acids that can last for 20 to 40 minutes. And if you keep eating regularly, that can happen. 
<clears throat> and so you have a greater risk of cavities to form. And, you know, we think everything, it, a lot of people think that it's just sugars that can cause cavities, not, not necessarily. It could be anything that's sticky. For example, raisins, we think raisins are healthy, which they could be, but if they stick in your teeth, they're not that healthy because they will stay there and can hide and can also cause cavities. Things like applesauce, again, very sweet, sticky, pudding, gelatin. Of course, vegetables like we all know would be the most healthy. Milk is healthy, cheese is healthy. So the caveat being a lot of children on uh, the spectrum have varied diets. They have restricted di restrictive diets. So of course you can't include or disclude some of these things, but as long as you keep the child's teeth clean, make them drink lots of water and sort of maintain the best you can do with that diet, it would really help um, in the cavity prevention mechanism. Um, back to sugar. A lot of the artificial sugars can cause cavities. Better to eat natural fruits because they, um, well, fresh fruits are not natural fruits, or look for products that have no added sugar on them. Uh, the biggest bane of my existence is a lot of the, um, and I'm not going to say that I don't have a Pepsi now and then I do too, but too much of it, especially Mountain Dew. Mountain Dew, if you look over here, it's a lot of sugar. 11 teaspoons. Who'd have thought that? One Mountain Dew. So just be mindful about what you do. And if you are going to give any of these to your child, I would restrict it and certainly dilute it with water. That goes the same with juice. Um, cereals. A lot of kids eat cereals. I eat cereal, but I would be a little mindful about what you eat and see how much sugar it has. And, um, you know, you can tell something like Fruit Loops, coloring, of course, these are things that are marketed for kids, right? Because they're so colorful, they're so sweet, but you have to be mindful of the amount of sugar that they do contain. And I'm not here promoting or not promoting any types of food. I'm just here to tell you that be wary or mindful about what you eat and just keep your teeth clean after that. If I were to pick gum, I'd pick sugar-free gum. And because sugar-free gum has xylitol, which can reduce caries. Even the vitamins, you know, which we all uh, give our kids, just be mindful of the fact that it can stick. So at least have them rinse, have them have water, brush their teeth, any kind of dried food. So it's the same principle. A lot of the sugar sweetened medications, uh, if they're taking on, if they're taken on a chronic basis, just make sure that the child can drink water. You're not going to ask the doctor to change the medication, of course, but just be mindful that a lot of them do contain sugar. So have them drink water afterwards. These are just little, little things you can do to help prevent cavities from occurring. A lot of the inhalers too, because they dry them out, they um, can cause, uh, they, they decrease the saliva. So back to drinking water, brush your child's teeth with the fluoride toothpaste, just things that you can do as a parent to mitigate the effect of all of these uh, medications and what they may cause. I briefly mentioned about how it would be brush. Many ways, depending on the age of the child, but if it's a little child, you can have the child laying on your lap like we did earlier. And you can just lift the lip up. You don't really need a lot of toothpaste, just a bare, like for a child three and over, you need the size of a pea, the amount of toothpaste. For a child younger than three, just even as small as a rice grain. As long as it's flor fluoridated, that's good enough because it's a very small amount. Again, the common complaint I hear is my child eats toothpaste. You don't really need to use a lot. You need to use very, very little. And the amount of fluoride that is in the toothpaste and the amount that we use of the toothpaste, it's pretty safe. So you can do it from the back. You can do it from behind. And you can. You should also start flossing your child's teeth, again, based on the ability of um, how much your child will let you do it. Sometimes you can brush together. So various ways of just encouraging the child to brush the teeth or for you brushing for them. Um, common question, which toothpaste is the best toothpaste? There really isn't one. It's just the one, as long as it has fluoride in it, that's pretty good. Uh, I mentioned the amount of toothpaste. So if you look here, a baby tooth, a toothbrush with a smear, you literally, that's all you need. Uh, older than three, just a small pea size, that's all you need. 
And a lot of the water, I know Dubai isn't fluoridated in terms of water, but we do get fluoride from the toothpaste and a lot of other sources. So I would be a little wary of recommending any kind of um, external fluoride sources in terms of medication. I would just stick to toothpaste, water, and uh, we do get it in other sources in our foods. Um, I mentioned fluoride varnish. This is, again, a concentrated form of fluoride, which we do at the dentist office once every six months. It's shown to be very effective in preventing caries. Uh, it, it's not going to uh, reduce the size of a cavity once it's formed, but it's going to prevent caries from happening. Again, very um, towards the end, I'm just going to talk very briefly about this program that Dr. Bahi and that Bahij and I are soon to be doctor, I think, as well. Uh, our, um, our conversation started about this. So like you mentioned briefly, I've just uh, become an adjunct faculty at Ajman University. And the program that they have there is a mobile dental clinic. So literally this dental van comes equipped with dental chairs and what we, what they have done in the past is gone to schools and or gone to even adult centers and they do a screening program where the, you know, maybe the child cannot come to the dentist. So the van goes to that particular school. And then obviously with the, finding out the medical history of each child, obtaining the consent from the parent beforehand, we do intend to do screening programs for children with special healthcare needs. And we're in the process of um, making this plan happen in terms of the location and where would this bus go. But essentially, this would entail, like I said, the parent signing a consent form, filling up the medical history form so we know what your child has. And then we do a screening program, which means we first look at the child, each child, based on the ability that we can at least look, uh, possibly take x-rays if we need to with the consent. Once we see what the child has, then we report back to the parents saying, this is what we found. And then the choices the parents have are to take them to their own dentist if they have one or come get treated the next time around in this van if it's possible for the child to be treated on the van. Or if there's something extensive, then we would probably refer them to another source. And in this case, it would be Ajman University. So this is a program I'm very, very excited about because this would be addressing a unmet um, oral health care need, which a lot of parents with special health care needs uh, face, because many a times it's hard for you to find a dentist who would be willing to see your child. So this way, I'm hoping we can um, expand this program. And my wish would be to see every child in the UAE that has special health care needs on this van or somehow or the other, which I know is a very altruistic and a very high hope, but we have to start somewhere. So that's the plan for the Ajman University van. And with that, I'm going to thank you very, very much. I'm going to leave my email here, but I would be more than happy to answer any questions. I'm going to stop sharing. Okay. Thank you, doctor. Uh, that, was, that was very informative. I did attend one of your workshops back in May. That's how we met. Um, yeah very like hands down to to what you're what you're trying to do it is a need that we are facing in this field uh here in uae i won't take much time from if anybody wants to have a question uh you can raise your hand and i'll stop talking <laughs> so that i can let other people talk but i do want to uh, add my uh, personal experience working with kids on the spectrum regarding uh, brushing their teeth programs for uh, teaching them how to brush their teeth and oral health care uh, because we, we do these programs with parents and we do get most of the uh, prog problems that uh, that you tackled uh, today in this presentation. <clears throat> so uh, one thing that uh, triggered me to have this, uh, me talking now is most parents, they they stick on the idea that they have to brush their the, the teeth of their children in the bathroom. And it's very good that you mentioned on your slide that it's not necessary to have the brushing teeth in the bathroom as a routine or something that you need to do in the bathroom. Because 
we all were taught that it's going to be in the bathroom. So we want the same for our children. And if that doesn't happen, we don't even think about it. Like we don't even think that it, that we can do it outside. Um, so that was a very, very good point. Um, and with swallowing the, uh, the toothpaste, I've worked with kids. They immediately, as soon as you put the toothpaste, the toothpaste on the toothbrush, it's gone. They, they swallow it. They like the taste. So I like the fact that you mentioned unflavored uh, toothpaste. That, that's amazing. Uh, it, it does remove the, the, uh, that behavior of swallowing and repeating the swallowing every time you try to uh, brush the teeth of the kid. Um, so, um, I, I really like, uh, how you presented it and the patience that is needed to, to do this. Uh, we also had a program with one of the kids, uh, we contacted a dental clinic. We had to visit them several visits actually, and they were very understanding to get the kid familiar with the dental, with the dentist, with the chairs, with the materials, which each material, how it's, how it's going to be how they're going to be using it. We used social stories. We used visuals. Uh, at the beginning, he used to go inside and then run back outside the, the the clinic. And it took us several visits before he was able to sit down and listen and comply and open his mouth and all these things. So uh, desensitization is is one of the uh, approaches that is, is amazing, uh, that gives amazing results and showing them the uh, I don't even know the name, the one that makes the sound. So drill. the drill, yep, the drill and the, the materials. We we went far as to we bought a dental kit for the for the child to just to get familiarized at home. So whenever he's playing around, we would open that dental kit and then he would be familiarized with the items. Maybe he would use the mirror as a drum, for example. Um, or he, or we might say, oh, open your mouth. And then we put the mirror in his mouth, then take it out. He continues playing and slowly build, build it up until he sits on the chair. We say, open your mouth. And then he follows. So, um, thank you so much for this, uh, for this, uh, informative presentation. I will leave the floor to anybody who wants to ask a question now. Thanks. If not, then um, we have your email. Uh, you you can uh, contact uh, Dr. Nita on on the email that she shared, and uh, soon we yes, will. Exactly. Sorry for cutting you off, Mr. Bahish, but this is the my the only question I would like to ask. That would you please share uh, every detail you can because I would like to have to arrange a visit. Excellent. We will do that. Yes. Um, I'll yes. I'll send her email to you, and yes. uh, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> excuse me. We do have uh, the visit happening Great. for AIS uh, clients, so we will yes. be uh, seeing Dr. Nita um, yes. with us. So all our Great. families that we are working with, they will have the 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 free screening and. Uh, we will be meeting at at the bus location once we finalize the location and the time of of Great. the bus. Um, Great. But your email Lovely. will be shared with you guys all. Very good. Very thank good. you, thank you so much for this. Thank and you. I would like to express my gratitude to you and to the doctor because her presentation addressed everything, covered every question I have, leaving no detail unmentioned. I was uh, I was asking I will about to ask her about the inhaler. She already mentioned it about the toothpaste. She already mentioned it. So thank you so much for this. Excellent. You're most thank welcome. You. If you have any questions left over, please feel free to email me. And, um, you know, like Mr. Bahid said, we are looking to expand or not expand, but start this program, at least for the kids with special health care needs, since these um, Ajman University program is already existing. And um, yeah. inshallah, it'll be soon. And uh, in the meanwhile, Please feel free to share any questions, any Perfect. thoughts, any concerns. I'd be happy to address them. Thank you so much. I will. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Sure. Um, we do have uh, a, a direct message. So one person is asking, my kid doesn't know how to gargle, gargle and spit. 
how should I teach him gargling and spitting? Okay. Um, actually, before I do that, I'm going to share my work email versus, I think I saw my oh, email in there. Sorry, I think I got the no, wrong that's email. that's okay. Yeah, that's the wrong one. Because I need to, let me just put that in there. Because it was, uh, give me one second, I will address that question. Sure. Why can't I chat? Um, uh, you should be able to. Give me a sec. Okay. Or, oh. or if you want, if you want to send it to me, then I'll share it. Got it. Got it. No, I'm not sure. Um, okay, I shared it in the chat. Sorry to your question about how can you help your how to, how can you help teach your child to gargle? Can I ask how old your child is? He's 10 years old. Okay. And you're teaching him to gargle, to spit out toothpaste or gargle in general? Or just curious where the question was headed. Uh, gargling and uh, spitting the toothpaste after brushing. Um, I mean, there's no special way to teach a child how to gargle. But the only advice I can give you is, like I mentioned earlier, and what Mr. Bahij was referring to, I would use a small amount of toothpaste to begin with, because then even if he cannot gargle, the fact that the toothpaste is spread over the teeth and the fluoride of the toothpaste stays on the teeth, that's fine. Because not, like for example, a three-year-old cannot gargle, but we still brush their teeth. So it would be the equivalent of, the, of that. There's no, unfortunately, there's no special way to teach a child how to gargle because... When you do do it, does he spit out or does he um, does it drool out or um, what happens when you try when he tries to gargle at the moment? He doesn't understand uh, if I ask him to gargle or spit, so I just put his head down uh, the near the wash basin, and then I I model him. I just model him how to spit, but uh, still he's not doing. That's why. Yeah, so I don't think there's a way to do it, but I think what you're doing is probably the best way. But I would still, again, recommend not using so much toothpaste that you actually see the need to make him gargle. If he just, if you use a small amount and if he, um, is he eating the toothpaste? Is that your fear? No, ma'am. He's not eating, but uh, like uh, after having any food, I wish if he learns to gargle, it will be fine. It's in lieu of not being able to, I would probably give him at least some water because it, if the, the intention of gargling is to wash out the, the, I suppose, the food particles. But at least if you give him water to drink, maybe that will help keep the teeth clean. But I am afraid I don't have a a way to describe how or teach a child how to gargle. Uh, okay, Dr. Nita, do, do you mind if I jump in? Please do. Thank you. Miss um, Camila, this is a behavior that we work on and that we, we teach in, in our practice in behavior analysis. So uh, to, to start a kid with uh, spitting we don't start with what we want him to spit so let's say water or uh, a toothpaste or something <clears throat> try first because we want the behavior of spitting to happen first so that you can reward that behavior so he knows that wh while i spit i i get something positive in return so to do that you can start with solid objects for example, uh, a rubber band or uh, something that he can put in his mouth, um, like or a rubber rubble ball, something small, and then let him spit it in the sink. Once he spits yes, it sir. in the sink, you reinforce that. You present something that he likes. Uh, maybe you make it. I I don't know any background about your kid, but. You can make it fun. You can you can do, whoa, look at how you did it or have a high five. Or you can, if he's 10 and you're doing some money, money management, you can tell him, okay, I'll give you five dirhams because you did it. Uh, whatever rewards or things that you know that he likes, 
uh, and and you can do that. So the first step is you're doing it right that you're modeling. Now you can do the same with solid objects. And once he gets the habit of spitting those items, then you can switch to little softer and liquid form um, of, of things and see how that goes. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. Thank okay. you. I will try. I will definitely try this. Thank, Thank you. you. Excellent. Great. Great idea. Thank you. I learned something new too. Thank you. Okay. I'm not sure if there are any more questions. Yeah. So if no further questions, I would like to thank individually because we are a small number. Uh, so I would like to thank uh, uh, Ms. Camila, uh, Kay Coat, uh, Ms. Hina, Ms. Jaylene, and uh, not sure, Ms. or Mr. Mahu Nadim. And thank you all for joining. And a special thanks for Dr. Nira for giving us this uh, this talk and uh, providing the awareness for uh, oral health care for special needs. Thank you so much. And hopefully we guys will see you soon. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Take care. Thank you. Bye.